All right guys, today's video is one I've been wanting to make a while now. I get asked a lot if I didn't have a whiskey channel, what are the bourbons and whiskeys I don't buy or hunt anymore. With folks making more informed decisions on whiskeys these days and with so many bottles on the market to compete, this is a subject I've been chatting about with my viewers and patrons for a little while now. And I think it's time to reveal my list once I, you know, compiled it. Stay tuned, it's gonna be a fun one. It's the Mash and Drum. What's up folks, I'm Jason C from The Master and Drum and welcome back to the show. Like, subscribe and help me get to 100,000 subscribers for 2024. Appreciate the support everybody. All right, before we get into my list, let's talk about upgrading your personal style and your fit with today's sponsor, it's Into The AM. Into The AM, an epic team of artists and creators who are creating clothing that elevates self-expression and provides unparalleled comfort for wherever your passion takes you. For me personally, t-shirts can be kind of a pain to search for. I've always been a bit barrel chested, I like to work out, so finding t-shirts that fit right can be a chore. Sometimes medium's too small and large is too large, but Into the AM, however, has really cracked the code for me. As soon as I put one of these shirts on, I knew I had something. And we're just talking about the basic tees, they have long sleeve, short sleeve, V-neck, crew neck, and all the colors you could ask for. These shirts are high quality, comfortable, and fit me perfect. Another thing I love about Into the AM is their creativity. The graphic tee designs definitely plays to the whiskey lover in me and probably all of us. The first thing you notice is how vibrant the colors are and how unique the designs are as well. And guess what? No tags. No, none of those tags you gotta kinda reach back and pull off because they're scratching the back of your neck. They have the Bourbon Voyage tee, the Dripping Virtue tee, and if you're into music, sports, nature, fitness, cars, and other interests, Into the AM has some of the coolest shirts I've seen and they add more cool designs all the time. In fact, scroll through the designs and let me know in the comments which ones are your favorites. They're all made with high quality soft fabrics, eco-friendly inks, and standout craftsmanship. As a bonus, I've washed them and worn them and the colors just don't fade. And I'm not the only one who loves their style. With over 30,000 five-star customer reviews, Into the AM is the brand that customers seem to love. Their unique designs, top-rated customer support, and lightning-fast global shipping will get you any apparel you order fast. Plus, you get a 30-day money-back guarantee and hassle-free returns if you're not satisfied with your order. I've been recently sporting these tees on videos. I've gotten comments on exactly where I'm getting them, and I couldn't be happier to bring them to you. Okay, here's how to get your fit upgraded with Into the AM. Use my link below in the description to save 10% off your order from Into the AM. You can pick out some amazing apparel now, and if you want, you can use it to get 10% off their special graphic t-shirt three pack. It's a great deal. So again, make sure you click that link in the description below and get 10% off these premium made tees today. They also have hoodies, joggers, and some other great stuff as well. Thanks to Into the AM for sponsoring the video, and thanks to you guys for making the sponsors happen. Cheers. All right, so to give you a little precursor as to which bourbons and whiskeys I wouldn't buy anymore, these bottles were selected not necessarily because they are bad whiskeys or bourbons, but more so because of three different factors. Price increases, my palate has probably changed a bit, or there's just been other whiskeys that have come into the market that best it. Usually from craft distillers just making great whiskey that's catching up to the higher price brands with more name recognition. All right, here we go. All right, so the first bottle on this is gonna be from Yellowstone, and this is just their flagship 93 proof bourbon. There's just nothing about it that really stands out to me. I'd rather just kind of go to Jim Beam and grab a Baker's or grab you know something else from them, something that's a little bit of a higher proof, something that has a little bit more age to it. At the same time, I don't mind the Yellowstone limited releases, even though that one was kind of on the fence, but a couple of those have come out recently where I do kind of enjoy it, and there is some older whiskey in it, but for me, Yellowstone 93 proof, that's kind of out for me. Next one is the Maker's Mark store picks. Like I, you know, enough with the staves, like all the combinations of staves, every combination I'm sure has been done. You know, I know they're, they're different. People really enjoy them. They're really sweet, most of them. Sometimes they're a little bit more spicy. I mean, I get it, but these have been around for so long and I think the combinations is just kind of, it's not that they're bad. I, I do still enjoy them from time to time. But to buy one again, I just feel like I'm just kind of tired of it, unfortunately. 
Now they do have the wood finishing series that they discontinued, but then they're coming back with it. They did release the Cellar Age, the higher age one that was really excited last year, really enjoyed that bourbon. But for me, these picks are just getting a little bit long in the tooth. Next up for me is Angel's Envy. Now, I do have respect for the port finished bourbon because I have used that bottle to get people into bourbon. And also the rum finished rye, which I don't really think tastes like a rye, it tastes more like a flavored liqueur to me because it's so inherently sweet. Um, however, I do tend to keep those bottles around just because if there are beginners coming over that have never tasted bourbon or rye whiskey, those are kind of a nice introduction into the category. However, when it comes to their store picks or even their special releases, I think for what you get, the prices are usually so high, they're non-H stated. Most of their special releases are $250 and above. It's just too much money for what's out there on the market. I think the beginner market's really great for Angel's Envy, but as far as some of those special releases and what you're getting, yep, just, I'm kind of out on those. Next one up is a Midwinter's Night Stram, and this has nothing to do with this being a bad whiskey anymore. It's a, it's a really good whiskey. I enjoy this rye. I think it's, it's, it's iconic. Probably one of the first, if not the first, port finished rye whiskey that was out in the market. Everybody used to go nuts for it. But I think this is a prime example of a price increase. This bottle going for about $150 now and even more in some areas. And then you have other distillers that are making port finished rise that are catching up to it. And in some cases, even besting it. The Sagamore port finished rye, that is a $80 bottle, $75, $80 bottle. And I would take that all day over this one. So I just think for me, if I didn't have a channel, I probably wouldn't be buying these anymore or hunting them down. They've just gotten too pricey. And like I said, the market has caught up to it. Next one up is probably Smoke Wagon, Uncut, Unfiltered. I wasn't sure whether to put this one on the list because I still I still do enjoy these. I don't know, you guys let me know in the comments if you're still hunting these out. It's just that the latest batches that I've had haven't been as impressive as the earlier batches. Now, I'm not sure if that's just, you know, some of the barrels that they're working with or um, their younger barrels now rather than the older ones they had. But these to me, I think there are so many people doing different things with blends, especially blending NGP, that it's just hard for the Smoke Wagon Uncut Unfiltered to stand out. Now, any special releases that they do, I'm probably all in on. Um, some of the experimental stuff, I'm always willing to try. But for these in particular, I don't know. It just doesn't excite me like it used to. Another brand that I actually don't own a bottle of anymore is Castle & Key. I, I'm not really sure what happened with their bourbon. Their rye is okay. But that bourbon, the last batches of bourbon that I've had from Castle and Key have been undrinkable to me. Not really sure what's going on, but for me, Castle and Key, it's such a beautiful distillery. Obviously, the old Taylor distillery, the history there, everything there should scream amazingly good quality bourbon. But the bourbon just has never lived up to the beautiful location. I think the Restoration Rye is pretty good, but as far as the bourbon goes, man, I, I think there's just some work to do there. Woodford Reserve Masters Collection. Now listen, the batch proof, I would probably still buy every now and again if I heard that it's a really good batch. However, the other Masters Collection batches that Woodford Reserve puts out, like the Triple Sonoma finish, the Stouted Mash release that they did, I, I just can't bring myself to spend the $150, $160 on those bottles anymore, especially when they're proofed down to 90.4 every single time. The batch proof, I think I'm willing to still roll the dice on a little bit, but as far as these go, this was the last good one that I had. This was the Very Fine and Rare Bourbon, which I thought was probably their last really good Masters Collection release other than a batch proof, but I just haven't had a good one since then. Um, so unless I really hear good things about one or taste it myself, I'm, I'm out on these too. This one was tough to, to, to put on the list because, uh, you know, I do love what John Rempe does over at Blood Oath, but Blood Oath to me, and I understand the story around it, 98.6, there's a nice finish on it, there's usually some, some ultra-aged whiskeys in it, but I think the 98.6 proof is what holds it back, at least for me personally. Is it well blended? Absolutely. Is it a decently good bourbon whiskey? Absolutely. However, for me, from my palate, the proof just doesn't do it for me anymore. Every time I try these, I love the front of the palate, but the finish just dies. I really thought it was gonna be a higher proof version of this for 2024, but it doesn't look like that's happening. I think I still think it's staying 98.6. So for me, it's not that it's a bad bourbon, it's just that the proof and it's staying at 98.6 is, I don't know, it's just kind of got me out on it. 
All right, the next couple bottles here I actually don't own anymore, and those are 1792 Full Proof and also the Sweet Wheat. First and foremost, I have reviewed the Sweet Wheat, and that thing is too sweet and it's too wheat <laughs> for me. It is, it literally drinks like water. Other than Traveler from Buffalo Trace, it's probably one of the most easy sipping whiskeys on the planet. And while that might be good for some, it's not good for me. Now, 1792 Full Proof, I would also add to the list because I can't say I've had a really good store pick in a long time. Now, you guys, again, let me know in the comments if you get more frequent 1792 uh, Full Proof picks uh, near you and if you've had some good ones lately. I can't remember the last time I had a good one. Usually, I have picked up some big box store, uh, you know, single barrel picks and they just drink way too hot. There's no flavor at all. So I just, every time I see them, I just kind of skip them on by, but hopefully you guys out there are getting better options than I am. Next one up, this is gonna be fun. Anything Amburana. I don't care what it is. I'm over Amburana finishes, done. Enough with the cinnamon toast crunch in a bottle. I can't take it anymore. There's too many of them out there. The only one I could kind of stomach is the Penelope Rio because that has a honey finish on it as well. So I think that combination and the honey being a little bit more stronger for me on that whiskey than the Amburana, I think actually helps it. But most stuff that is, now this is the bottle I think that did it for everyone, which is the Starlight uh, Cigar Batch Whiskey. When these started coming out and the Amburana barrels were introduced to the market, everybody started doing Amburana. Everybody wanted to get their hands on them and we just saw way too many. I just, I kind of liked it in the beginning. I thought it was different, unique, but now everybody's doing it and I'm over it. No more Amburana for me. Next up is Will It Rye. Yeah, I'm just, I don't know. Will It to me, I know there are a, a lot of cult followers of Will It that people just absolutely love what they do, but I don't know, like to me, the Rye's at three, four years old, whatever they are now, 60, $65, $70, yeah, no. Like it just, it's not worth it to me. I think they're, they're very dill forward to me. I get a lot of just, you know, notes I really don't like on rye whiskeys. I know there's a lot of people that love the Willet Rye, but that's just not my palate. Um, even the bourbons, the, the younger age bourbons for like $300, $400, I just, the prices are just ridiculous. And there's just too many good options right now to warrant spending that money on Willet. I don't care how much you love Willet, you can't tell me that, you know, a four to five year old Willet is better than a nine or 10 year old bourbon I can get for half the price. Uh, next up is Kentucky Owl. Um, this is batch two of the rye. This, I've had this bottle for a while. I take very small sips of anything I have Kentucky Owl from back in the Dixon Deadman days. But now that Stoli has bought it, all the releases for from Kentucky Owl have been, I mean, mostly two, north of two to $300, sometimes $500. I think that New Orleans one, the Mardi Gras edition they did, was like a $500 bottle. Like, stop it. Like, what are you doing with the pricing? I feel like when Dixon was blending Kentucky Owl, had a really good kind of foothold in the market. People were loving it. They love the throwback label to this. I still love the throwback label to this. I love the story of it. It has a very rich history. However, now the bottles become kind of a dust collector on the shelf. Every time I go to a store, I see them sitting on the shelf. Nobody's buying them anymore, and neither am I. This one's gonna get you going. Well or foolproof? I don't care anymore. <laughs> I think as more bourbon distillers have come in the market with just fantastic weeded bourbons, this doesn't really do it for me anymore. Yeah, is it nice to have on your shelf and you know, if, you're fin if you wanna finish the Weller Vertical, I'm not going out of my way to hunt for this bottle at all or even buy one. I could, I'd rather go buy a Larceny Barrel Proof. Even the Ben Holiday Soft Red Wheat at Rick House Proof, I think could even best this. So too many options on the market to worry about this bottle anymore for me. Next up is uh, Rabbit Hole. I think for me, Rabbit Hole has gone towards a more premium type of whiskey buyer, especially if you look at their, their Founders Reserve releases where I've seen them, what was the, the Mizunora one, I think was what, $500, $600. The Rye, I think was two, $250. These, which are their you know standard releases, kind of their core lineup, can range to about 60, 65 bucks now. It's a really nice bottle, great story. I do like what they're doing, but the prices and the stuff that I'm getting inside the bottle, again, non-age stated, not really getting anything too new except from those Founders Reserve bottles, but those Founders Reserve bottles are really high priced and I'm just not willing to pay the price for them. Now I can end the video with either Blue Run, Jep the Creed, or even Blends or some other stuff that I talk about, but my last bottle might surprise you. This one might be a little controversial, but uh, Rock Hill Farms from Buffalo Trace. I, I don't know. 
I've had at least six, seven, maybe eight of these, and they have never impressed me to the point where I feel like I have to overpay or go hunt for these. I have seen these in stores marked up to $300, $350, and even beyond that, it's ridiculous. I don't think that the bourbon in the bottle is worth anything close to that. I honestly would just rather drink Eagle Rare. I know this is 100 proof. I think for some people, the chase is part of the love of this bottle. And for me, I'm over it. There's, there's nothing that I've tasted in this bottle that has made me say, I gotta get myself another bottle of Rock Hill Farms. I'm just, the bottle is kind of different and pretty, but other than that, yep, yeah, I'm skipping it. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video on all the bourbons I wouldn't buy if I you know, didn't have a whiskey tube channel. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit the subscribe button below. Please hit the like button. And if you have any, find me on Instagram. Let me know down in the comments what you think about my list. And also give me some of the bottles that you wouldn't buy anymore. I would love to kind of curate, crowdsource a whole list and see what bottles people aren't buying these days. So with that said, like I always say, it's not about the whiskey, it's the people you share it with. Cheers. I'll see you next time right here on the Mass and Drum. Take care, folks.